Hi everybody, it's Randy Baker from Composition and Visual Design. Today I'm just going to go through how to focus, expose, and white balance the camera. We're going to talk about ISO and ND filters and shutter speed and all that stuff as well. So uh, this is what you're going to need to really, these are part of the five core competencies that you're going to need to know to make it through this class. So make sure you pay attention to this and you really get these down. The secret is to watch this information, read the information that we provide you, and then go out and practice each of these individually. Don't try to do these all together. You know, set up uh, 10 different things that you're going to focus on in a room and then go through and do eye peaking focus mag, eye peaking focus mag, eye peaking, the focus workflow. Then set up and light a shot and then uh, you know, uh, you know, learn how to use the zebra two stripes, you know, get something that with some, you know, tonal range in it that you're shooting with some whites and some darker areas. And then, you know, iris up and learn how to use zebra two stripes for whites. Um, and then uh, also how to use the waveform monitor and how to read the waveform monitor. Not difficult. Take you about an hour of practice to really get it down and become, you know, proficient at it. Um, and then also how to do the white balance workflow and um, then we'll talk about using the rule of thirds grid and doing three-point lighting. We have other videos for both of those things as well. So let's get started here. So zooming. So this lens is not a very uh, uh, a, a servo lens, meaning that you can't press the servo rockers on the camera. There are two rockers, one on the top handle, one on the on the uh, uh, right hand grip, top of the right hand grip. That you know, if you had a servo zoom, you could zoom in and out by just you know, pressing those rockers. You can't do that. This is a manual zoom. The, uh, on the lens here, this is your lens hood. This is the focus ring. This is the uh, push auto button. This is the uh, uh, focal length. This is how you zoom in and out. This is your autofocus and manual focus. Got to be on autofocus. This is your steady shot. It's got to be off. Okay. So to zoom in and out, you go up on the on the lens and you zoom in and you go down on the lens and you zoom out. And the, and the focal length range on this camera is 24 to 70. So if you look at the, uh, I'm sorry, 24 to 105. If you look at this lens and I zoom in all the way out, it goes to 24 millimeters. And if I zoom in all the way in, it goes to 105 millimeters up here in the corner. This is where the focal length is. And you can see that. And so you can change the focal length. This is called a, uh, a, a zoom lens. The other type of lens is uh, known as a um, prime lens. And this is an example of a prime lens. This is a Rokanon E-mount 85 millimeter lens. So this is a fixed focal length lens of only 85 millimeters. To move this lens, to get it to be tighter or uh, wider, you physically move the camera in and out. That's what you do. It's called sneaker net. Um, so prime lenses are uh, smaller and have less glass in them, so they're usually cheaper and they're faster. By faster, I mean when we talk about the speed of a lens, the faster the lens, the smaller the aperture. So, you know, this lens is an f1.4. Your lens is an f4. It's considered to be a medium speed lens. This is considered to be a fast lens. For zoom lenses, you know, a good fast zoom lens starts about f2.8. For prime lenses, that's 1.8, um, you know, 1.4, somewhere in those areas for a fast lens. And that, the faster the lens, the more it allows you to get a much shallower depth of field. So you get that more cinematic, shallow depth of field look on that. Um, so if you if you turn your uh, zoom ring on the lens up, you zoom in. If you go down, you zoom out. And if you look on the lens, there's some scales there that show you uh, what that looks like. Um, this is probably a little bit better. So uh, here's all the scales that tell you where you're at, 24 to 105. You can easily look at the size of the lens, but it also tells you that in the viewfinder. And then along here, it's just telling you that it's an FE style lens. F4 minimum aperture, 24 to 105, and it's a G series. Sony makes um, <clears throat> normal lenses, G lenses, and then GM, G master lenses, and the OSS stands for optical steady shot. So this is the tulip lens. The tulip lens goes out front. The lens stays on the camera, and then the thyre clasp, you don't take it off. We want you to use the lens that came with the camera on this. So let's talk about focus. So for a lot of people, they don't really understand what's going on when they focus. So it's really important that you understand that. So the way you focus on this lens is you zoom all the way into 105 millimeters on your focal point. The focal point is the main object of the shot that's telling the story. So you always have to know what the focal point of your shot is. Um, that comes important in, in uh, becomes important in week three. For example, if you're shooting like a your landscape shot and it's a barn out in the middle of the field, you got to zoom all the way in at 105 millimeters on the front of that barn and adjust your focus using your you know peaking and focus mag, which we'll go through. So when you set your focus on the front of that barn, 
you're setting what's called a plane of focus or a focus point. That focus point is where that image is going to be the sharpest, the most in focus. And as you move <coughs> away from that point towards the camera, you go slightly, you go out of focus. And as you move away from that point away from the camera, you go out of focus. And so on standard lenses, there's something called the rule of thirds for that focus. So let's say, and that, that, um, amount of space that's acceptably in focus, what we call an acceptably in focus image, as you move away from that point closer to the camera, away from that point farther away, is called the depth of field. How much of that, you know, field is an acceptable focus? The focal plane, uh, on the side of the camera to infinity, that's your field. How much of that field is actually in focus? We talk about in terms of the depth of field. Um, and we usually talk about that in feet or, you know, uh, meters or inches or millimeters. So in this case, for example, let's say you had a uh, three foot depth of field and you can you can do that. There's lots of apps out there that are called focusing apps, depth of field apps uh, that you can get. And if you know that you've got a full frame camera and you know the distance, the focus distance, you set your fo uh, uh, focus on that object and you know the focal length of it and the aperture, it will tell you what your depth of field is going to be. It's going to tell you what the near depth of field is from the focus point to the towards the camera it's going to tell you what your far depth of field is the focus point from away from the camera and on standard lenses there's something called the rule of thirds where let's say you got a three foot depth of field then that would mean one foot from that focus point towards the camera is going to be in focus and two feet from that uh, depth of field that focal point to the uh, behind that is going to be in focus so uh, it doesn't work on wide lenses, doesn't work on really wide lenses or really long lenses, but that's it. So that's what we mean when we talk about focus. So we throw banter about, you know, all these different terms, focal point, focal plane, focal, you know, focal point, um, uh, plane of focus. You just got to know what all those are. You know, focal point is the main object that you're shooting that tells the story. Focal plane or focal point is where you set your focus. Really that simple. So once you got your focus set, again, you got to learn how to control your depth of field. So if you and in week three, you're going to go into this in much more detail and you're going to learn that there are three things that affect your depth of field. Uh, and again, there's this acceptable level of focus. And if you want to get technical, you can go in and read the articles in the vault about, you know, circle of confusion and, you know, hyperfocal distance and things like that. Some of the more advanced focusing techniques. But for right now, what you need to know is that there's just a range where it's an acceptable level of focus um, that I can see. And that's the depth of field. <clears throat> so you can control that to be shallow, medium or deep, you know, and that in week three, you'll learn that there are three things that control that. Aperture, your f-stop number, uh, focus distance, how far away you are from the object that you're, sh you're shooting, also known as focus or distance from the camera to the subject. And then, of course, your focal length, wide, medium, or tight, uh, long focal length. So uh, focus distance and focal length only affect your depth of field slightly. We're talking about millimeters, inches, maybe a foot maximum, whereas your aperture affects it in feet, meters, yards. I mean, it's massive uh, change. So we talk about depth of field. Usually we're talking about aperture more than anything else affecting that. Just know that you can use all three things together to affect your depth of field, or you can use them individually, realizing that both, you know, aperture is the number one thing that affects it. Focus distance and focal length affect it slightly. Now with focal length, where you're zooming in and out, when you zoom all the way in, you compress the background. You and that artificially makes it look like it's a shallower depth of field. So you have to keep that visual um, thing in mind. And here, again, here's what it is. You, here's your focus point. Here's a narrow depth of field where the ninja is in focus, but the foreground ninja and all this elements up here is out of focus, and then the church in the background is out of focus. On the deep depth of field or a large depth of field, everything's in focus. You know, uh, you know, most of it's in focus. And so you can learn how to control that by using those three elements. And we'll go through that. There's a whole exercise in week three, shooting a shallow and deep depth of field. This, this lens, you can also put this in autofocus. And I, uh, up until this class, this camera, I was um, a person who would always say, never put your lens in autofocus. That's not true anymore. This lens has probably one of the best autofocus features on it I've ever seen. It can focus, especially on moving objects, better than I can. So, you know, if, you, if you're tracking moving objects like a bird or a race car or a person on a bike or somebody walking, you know, Put it in autofocus. This, this has a great face detect and eye detect. And also with the new firmware, you can actually touch on part of the frame 
and have it focused on that. So look at this. So I go in here and I just touch on my viewfinder right there. It focuses on that lens in the background. If I touch right here, it focuses on my foreground. So I, it's really that simple. And, and so um, you can, and, and so when you do that, you're in here, but as soon as you turn your lens, no, it goes back out. Okay, so I'm gonna, I know it was at three feet, so I'm gonna go to three feet where it was in focus before. Um, so autofocus is, is really your friend of that. In this class, we're gonna use manual focus. You know, I, I don't wanna see you in autofocus. You should never say AF up there. You should always say manual focus, but just know that you know you should be playing around with autofocus on this and i'll walk you through how to set this up uh, in week three how to set up your autofocus a little bit better uh and know there are times where the autofocus on this camera will work better than your eye never thought i would say that but i'm saying that um here's your lens you also have a push autofocus on the camera this is a good way to tell whether or not you're actually in focus on what you're doing um and uh it's this the, to to make the push autofocus work on the lens itself, you have, there's a switch that says AF and MMF. That has to be on autofocus. And then on the camera body, the front of the camera body, there's a focus switch here that says auto and manual. That has to be on manual. That's an auto there. It has to be on manual. Um, and that way you see the MF in the viewfinder and you're in manual focus, but you can push this button right here and hold it in. And while you're pushing that in, uh, it, the, your, your focus will go to autofocus. Look what happens up here. So if I, if I, Throw this out of focus, okay, right here, and I push and hold that button. Now it's going to focus again. And so when the focus stop, focus number stops moving, I let go of it, and it's in focus. Now the other way to do that is with the 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 uh, there's a focus a push focus button right down here on this. So if you if you do that and you push that and hold it in, it focuses. But you saw it focused on the back lens that time. Here when I pushed on it, it focused on the front lens, and so. You can change those in your in your um, um, menu setting, the focus settings, so that you have a spot and you can tell it where that spot is going to be. So autofocus works sometimes, gets you in the ballpark, but you got to have the camera set up right to be able to use it. Just know that. Um, if we and and so what I want to show you is where the focus is set from. So if you look on the left side of the camera here, you got a tape measure hook right here. It's called the focal plane tape me measure hook. It's a little bit of a dog and pony show for this camera. You wouldn't put a tape measure and run it out to the town because you'd pull the camera over on the tripod because your tripod's not strong enough. So don't do that. But right below that, right below this silver spigot, there's a little circle with a line through it. That's called the focal plane symbol. That's where the sensor is on the inside of the camera, and that's where your focus is measured from. Now, this lens has what's called the minimum focus distance. All lenses do. And the, it's really short on this. It's 1.25 feet. So if you adjust your focus ring, so if I go up here and adjust my focus ring to as shallow as it will go, uh, it will only go down to, to 1.2 feet. Okay, that's it. Okay, if I go all the way back, it goes to infinity. Infinity on this lens starts about 450 feet. You know, it's kind of hard to see that, but if you, if, depending on where your zoom is, you can see that easier. I'm just trying to ease that in to see. You saw 365 come up there. So again, I'm going to be at three feet. So the minimum focus, and you can use that knowledge that this has a minimum focus. For example, if I had something in the foreground here that I wanted out of focus, and then I had something in the midground I wanted in focus, but I wanted to be really tight on that, I can move this foreground object closer than 1.2 feet, 1.25 feet, and I know that would be automatically out of focus. So a good thing to know that there is a minimum focus distance on this camera. That's, again, another reason to always use focus mag on this when you're doing it. So besides your eye, what we're doing, we have a workflow that we're going to teach you how to use, how to focus, and that's going to include your eye, peaking, and focus mag. And the reason we're doing this workflow is because since birth to now, your eye and your brain have been working together in cahoots with each other to, to auto-focus everything for you. You've never had to pay critical attention to focus. That changes. Now you got to pay critical attention to focus. And if you're looking at a 3-inch monitor, 3.5-inch monitor, that's not a very big monitor to set focus on. And then when you're outside, even though you got the LCD uh, lens uh, hood on there, you're still going to have all this ambient light bouncing around in there. It's going to become very difficult to tell whether or not you're in focus. So the camera gives you two focusing aids, peaking, electronic focus peaking, which is just an electronic overlay that only appears in your viewfinder, 
uh, and that turns anything that has it works off of contrast. So anything that has contrast on it, like fine lines, fine detail, or fine edges, will turn bright red when you're in focus on that by adjusting your focus ring. So it's a little bit of a trick to get to use that because it, it's you, when you adjust that focus ring, you're not actually adjusting the lens elements in and out as so much as you're sending an electronic signal through the lens to the camera. There's a little gold connector on the back of the lens that talks to the little gold connector on the front of the camera lens flange. Uh, and that's sending it back. So there's a little bit of delay there. So you got to learn how to rock that back and forth to get it in focus. And you're looking at that. So uh, that's electronic focus peaking. Easy to use if what you're trying to focus on has fine lines, fine detail, or fine edges. Doesn't work if it doesn't have that on there. So and because of that, they give you another focusing aid. And that focusing aid is called Focus Mag. And that's the sign button number four on the top of your right handle. Uh, of your hand grip. Let's see if I can get that back up here. Here it is. So right there, sign button number four. And when you push that, what you see in your viewfinder, doesn't like to stay on that slide for some reason. Uh, when you push that, let me get back to this. What you see, that's not it either. There we go. When you push that button, what you see in your viewfinder is it will say focus mag. Why does it not want to stay on that? Isn't that weird? That is just really weird. Okay, when you push that, what you're going to see in your viewfinder, it says focus bank up here, and then you've got a 6x, you know, it says 6x digital zoom if you have your camera set up right. And in your viewfinder, you're going to see a part of the viewfinder that's zoomed in 600%, 6x. And that is represented here by this orange box. So the white box represents your entire viewfinder, what you were seeing in the viewfinder before you hit that button. And the orange box represents that 600% digital zoomed in portion of that. So with peaking on and this on, you can't get any closer than that. It's what called what's getting critical focus. So you always want to use focus mag to set your focus. Always, always. Okay. If you're not using focus mag, you're not focusing correctly. So important that you understand how to do that. Once you got your focus set, you've dialed that in that's the number you write down then you hit your focus mag button again number four get out of focus mag zoom back out as long as you don't hit the front uh, focus just you hit, uh, just your uh, zoom uh, ring then you're going to stay in focus because this lens is what's called a par focal lens meaning that if you zoom in and set your focus and zoom back out it will hold that and i'm telling you that because not all lenses are par focal lenses some lenses are what's known as uh, very focal lenses, meaning that you have to set your focus at the focal length that you're going to be shooting at. If you zoom in and set your focus and zoom back out again, you're out of focus. So just know that on most video cameras, there are par focal lenses. You zoom in all the way as tight as you can get on that object, set your focus and zoom back out. Here we're using the two focus aids of peaking and focus mag. And this is what it looks like, you know. So if you have peaking on, it's a personal preference. You can turn peaking on and off when you're in focus mag. I like to keep it on if I have fine lines and fine details. It just really helps me dial that in a little bit better. So that's it. Um, and then uh, focal length, uh, this is kind of out of place slide, but you just need to know that, you know, in terms of focal length, what we're talking about is how wide or how zoomed in you are. And so there are different types of focal length. There's extreme wide angle, which usually goes, you know, from about uh, uh, 12 millimeter for me to about 16 millimeter. Then from 16 to about 35, that's wide angle, 35 to uh, about 70, that's uh, normal lens. That's because the normal field of view, the eye sees is about 35 to 50. And then 70 to 1 uh, uh, over 100, that's medium focal length, anything on photo, anything over 400 millimeters, super telephoto. So there are different types of uh, uh, designations for the different focal lengths that you do. Your lens goes from extreme wide, 24 millimeter, all the way to telephoto, 105 millimeters. So that's a pretty decent lens uh, for doing that. Um, Focus workflow. Again, the focus workflow is easy. You, you zoom in on your focal point, which means you always need to know what your focal point is, all the way to 105 millimeters. With peaking off, you adjust your focus until it looks and focuses your eye. Then you turn your peaking on at 105 millimeters, adjust the focus on the exact same spot, and pay attention to both those numbers. When you first start out, those numbers are going to be slightly off an inch or two. 
Uh, and then once you have the peaking set, then you turn on your focus mag, put the 6x digital zoom on there, move the orange box onto that same spot you were trying to focus on before, and then adjust your focus ring. And again, pay attention to the number. That's the number you write down in your camera report. But what you'll find is when you first start out, all three of those numbers may be slightly different, an inch or two. That's fine, okay? You're, you're training your eye. What you want to get to, and when you know you're really good at this workflow and retrain your eye, when all three of those numbers are consistently the same over and over again. And the reason we are trying to do that is we want you to be able to use your eye as well as peaking and focus mag to look at your viewfinder and focus in case you get into a situation where you can't, don't have time to turn the, the peaking on or the focus mag on. It, it's easy to do. Now I use focus mag all the time. If I'm shooting interviews, for example, you can use focus mag while you're still reporting. So uh, I'll set the interview up and then I'll set my uh, orange box in focus mag right on the person's dominant eye. And then while I'm doing the interview, even though I'm zoomed out a little bit, <coughs> I'll hit my focus mag, mag button and I can look at my in my viewfinder because it doesn't get recorded. I can look at my viewfinder and tell right away whether I'm in focus on that person or not. And I can make any adjustments doing that. Get to know this focus workflow. Again, set up 10 things in a room and practice eye peaking focus mag eye peaking focus mag I, now it's better if you're lit you know it's easier to focus under bright light so you might need to bump up your base sensitivity to high or uh, throw up some lights here that's it um always focus on your focal point which means you need to know what the focal point is this lens is a par focal lens peaking works when zoomed out as well but it's much more accurate and you can test this you can zoom out and adjust your focus until you see the brightest red peaking and then zoom in on your focal point and do the same thing and you will see those numbers are off quite a bit uh, when shooting people use peaking to make sure the catch light in the eye the bright specular highlight in the eye is an easy way to tell if that's lit up red you're in focus on the eye and when you're shooting people you always want to be in focus 99 percent of the time you want to be in focus on the eye really important to do that um Exposure. Let's move on to exposure. So um, there, in, in, in still photography, there are three things that affect your overall exposure. And let's talk about in terms of something called the exposure triangle. ISO, shutter speed, and um, uh, uh, your f-stop, your iris. Okay. Again, we talk about iris you know, as different things. Uh, when you look at this, um, for example, if you look at this and you look really closely, the, the little mechanical diaphragm that opens and closes there, that's called the iris okay the mechanical diaphragm is called the iris the size of the hole the iris makes when it opens and closes is called the aperture the amount of light coming through that hole hitting the sensor that determines how much light hits the sensor is measured in uh, f-stops and f-stops are a fraction it's the focal length how zoomed or how zoomed out you are and the entrance pupil diameter of this lens that means i'm not measuring the entrance the diameter of the the uh, iris um, the aperture from here i'm actually measuring it from the front of the lens so if i looked at the front of this lens for example let me get this off so you can see this and you look at this okay so you can see if i open and close that it's it's so i'm measuring that uh, size of that hole from the front of the lens, not back here where the actual iris is. So uh, that's how you measure f-stops. It's measured in f-stops. Again, every time you add a stop of light, you double the amount of light. Every time you take away a stop of light, you half the amount of light. Now the light comes through that lens, and after it goes through the aperture, it hits the sensor. And the sensor itself is an electronic s uh, uh, shutter. So the shutter turns on and off. The whole entire sensor turns on and off for a fraction of a second. It's called a um, rolling sh shutter. It doesn't turn off exactly all at the same time. Very, very close. So the problem with rolling shutters is if you are moving the camera, you get what's called jello or you get this like wavy thing. If this was a straight post and I was panning past it, it would, it would shift like this. You see that a lot on propellers on planes where the propellers are actually bent. This rolling shutter is actually pretty good there's another type of shutter called the global shutter and that's where the sensor turns off completely and back on at the same time this camera doesn't have that it's a rolling shutter but it still does a pretty good job of this um so um and then the amount of time that that shutter is on determines how long that light coming through the aperture has to hit to expose and then the sensor itself, the sensor sensitivity to light, is known as ISO or gain. Now, every camera is set up to have its own specific base or native ISO and gain. That's where the camera is set up to operate its optical optimum performance. You're getting the best image quality out of it, the least amount of noise, the best color reproduction, the best contrast reproduction, the most dynamic range. 
So you always want to shoot at that native or base ISO or gain whenever you can. On this camera, 0 dB gain is always the base gain. Um, 800 ISO is the base ISO on this, but again, you can switch that if you go into your uh, user menu and go into um, uh, the very first thing, which is uh, <clears throat> ISO gain EI. So if you switch it and go into this, and let me go back back and back and then user and the very first thing if I go in this and I go to ISO gain mode so here you can switch between ISO and DB you want to be on DB and in all reality I just have to tell you this there is no such thing as ISO in video it's all gain okay it's, it's just a holdover from the old film days uh, you know ISO is a standard of measurement um, and uh, it's just like you know IRE we measure video signal in IRE um, it stands for International uh, International Radio uh, Institute of uh, Radio Engineers. Uh, and then ISO stands for uh, International Organization of Standardization. You would think it would be IOS, but it's not. Uh, ISO, the reason they say ISO is because it's a Greek term that means measurement. So they refer to it as ISO all the time. Again, it's just a holdover for us. Some people like ISO, some people like gain. It's, you know, Fahrenheit or Celsius. It's, you're measuring the same thing. It's just a different way of measuring it. Okay. So again, we're going to use gain here in this class. And then for the base ISO, uh, we'll be talking with base sensitivity. We'll be talking about that in terms of ISO on the camera as well. So we use it kind of interchangeably. You'll hear us talk about that. <clears throat> um, you don't want to be an auto iris in this class. Okay, so again, you just you, your camera will constantly be iris up and down. <clears throat> your shots won't match, so you don't want to do that. You do have the push auto iris on the camera, and that is the sign button number three on the camera. So if you go in here, for example, uh, and that's, again, it's, it's like the push auto focus. If you go in here and use this, um, it's a good way to tell whether or not you're in the ballpark for exposure. So if I expose this way down, for example, and then I just push and hold my assign button number three, look at my uh, aperture here when I do that. When I push it in and hold it, it gets an A in front of it, and it starts exposing. And so it goes all the way up, and it's going to stop at F4, F4. That's telling me that I'm all the way wide open, by the way. Um, but again, you can see from my standpoint, that's a little too hot. So I would probably bring that down to more like F4.5 or F5. That looks a little bit better to me. With um, standard gamma, this is a hybrid standard gamma, this has tone here. The secret is to always try to underexpose a little bit. You don't want to overexpose your whites because if you overexpose them more than a stop and a half or 98 IRE up here right close to the top of this uh, white line here, then you've blown out the whites forever. You're never going to get those back. And you can see that specular highlight is above the white line. In my viewfinder, I see zebra two stripes here and here and here and here. Okay, that's perfectly fine. Specular highlights, glares, you're going to see that. You want to try to mitigate those as much as possible. Or you want to try to get rid of those as much as possible. But you're looking at the overall exposure and you kind of, you know, it, this is where judgment and subjectivity comes in a little bit. Um, so that's it. Again, just use that push auto to tell you whether or not you're in the ballpark. Don't leave it there. Don't let it make the creative decision for you. Um, so that's push auto. Uh, and so it's another good tool for you. We have three ways of exposing the camera. You have um, if uh, this multifunction dial here, this big black dial here. And let me go through these because I have slides for those. The multifunction dial. So this is your iris button. If you push the iris button once, you go into um, put the white box around your iris. And then you can use, anytime you have a white box around any number, you can use the multifunction dial or the two eight-way multifunction tabs to go up and down. But you don't ever need to do that, by the way. So if you get out of that, then that's because you have three different, um, three different settings on the camera to be able to adjust dials on the camera to be able to adjust your iris. So if you don't have a menu up or you don't have a white box around something, this multifunction dial right here automatically defaults to uh, iris you can go up iris is down you go down and iris is up it's a little backwards and then on the top handle of your camera you've got this vertical dial here and if you go down if you set this right in the menu to opposite uh week one if you go down you iris down if you go up you iris up and then on the right front hand grip you have another dial right here it's called the uh, select dial and you can uh, if you go to the left you iris down if you go to the right you iris up those so those are the three ways you make the camera brighter or darker by uh, exposing 
Um, you got to really commit to memory these five f-stop numbers. F4, it's six numbers, five stops. It starts at F4, then it goes 5, 6, 8, 11, 16, 22. Those are the five full stops that your lens will do. A lot of lenses will do, you know, different stops. Most lenses, uh, fast lenses are 1, 1, 4, 2, 2, 8, uh, 4, 5, 6, 8, 11, 16, 22, 32. The, the mnemonic for this, the mnemonic is a simple way to learn something, is that every other number doubles. So you can see that here, 4, double 4, 8, 5, 6, double 5, 6, 11, 8, double 8, 16, 11, double 11, 22. Every other number doubles. So if you just remember the first two, F4 and F5, 6, you know the full stops. You have to commit these to memory. Okay. Your camera also measures in third stops. We don't want you to commit to memory the third stops yet. Just concentrate on the full stops right now. And with two, then you can work on your third stops. And it's four, four, five, uh, five, five, six, six, three, seven, one, eight, nine, ten, eleven, thirteen, fifteen, sixteen, um, 18, 20, 22. So you'll need to know those eventually down the road. But right now, concentrate on these five numbers. This is such an important concept. They have friends who have this tattooed on their wrist. Um, it's a little bit severe. And again, you can see it goes from 1, 4, or 1, all the way up to F32. This is a 1, 4 lens. They don't make F32 video lenses much anymore, and that's because of something called... Um, uh, uh, <laughs> I forgot the name of it. Um, uh, ref, uh, ref, refraction. Okay, so if you look at this, see that little hole there? So if you're my age or, you know, close to my age, you know, in the early days we had water hoses out in our lawn that had a single nozzle on them. It was just a single nozzle. If you opened it up, you had a steady stream of water out of that. But as you closed it down, at some point you'd have a cone of water. There'd be like a cone of water coming out because the hole got so small that the water came out as a cone. Same thing happens with light. Light bends. As the light comes through here, it bends. And if you get the hole too small, it, it you know, radiates out like this, diffuses the image slightly. So that's why you don't see many F32 lenses. It stops at F22 because of the larger sensor size. This is called the infographic. I use infographics all the time. This is probably the most used infographic in film and video. It talks about the exposure triangle, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO, how each of those things affect overall exposure. With your aperture, the smaller the aperture, the deeper the depth of field. The larger the aperture, the shallower the depth of field. Um, for your shutter speed, the faster the shutter speed, the more you freeze motion and the more light you need, the slower the shutter speed, the less you, uh, the more you blur motion and the less light you need. And average is about 148, uh, 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 48th of a second. And then for ISO, uh, the lower the shutter speed, uh, the lower the ISO, the least amount of noise and the best dynamic range and the higher the shutter speed or higher the ISO, the more noise and the uh, more the um, uh, you damage your dynamic range structure. For us, it, again, it's important to know that there's a base or need of ISO, and that's where you always want to shoot at. In gain, it's always zero. On this camera in ISO, that would be 800. So, um, again, what's not in there is the, um, the ND filters. Here's a really simple infographic about f-stops. talks about full stops and half stops, which your camera doesn't really do. It does full stops, and it does third stops. So again, what we talked about was four, uh, four, five, 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 six, six, three, seven, one, eight, nine, ten, eleven, thirteen, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty, and twenty-two. Those are third stops at a time. Just know that. Um, uh, commit those, you know, five uh, uh, numbers to um, f-stop numbers to memory. Zebra. So. Zebra is, again, like peeing. It's an electronic overlay that only appears in your viewfinder, doesn't get recorded to tape. And you've got two zebra stripes on this camera, zebra 2 and zebra 1. Zebra 2 is used for whites, and it's set at 90 IRE. That's because on this camera at 90 IRE, and we'll talk about what that means in a minute, you start losing detail in your whites. You start overexposing your whites. 100 is pure white, no detail. Zero is pure black, no detail. Um, so at 90 IRE on this camera, you start overexposing your whites. And that, that's it. So anytime you see zebra stripes on zebra 2, that means it's 90 and higher. That means that whatever you're seeing those zebra stripes on are overexposing a little bit. Zebra 1 is set for 70, and that's used for skin tones. So and that's because we have a 10% 
uh, aperture dialed into that. So that means you'll see zebra stripes from 65 to 75 when you have that 10% aperture dialed in and set for 70. And that's important because 65 is darker skin tone, 70 is Caucasian skin tone, 75 is North Dakota skin tone, or Nebraska skin tone. People who haven't seen the sun for a while, you know, pale white skin, that's where it's at. And, and so that covers pretty much the entire gamut. Now, some people like to set this a little bit lower. They like to set this for 65, and then they see zebra stripes from 60 to 70. Um, and so it's really a personal preference for what you want to do that. But what you're looking for when you use zebra one and skin tone is that you just see a little bit of zebra stripes on specular highlights on the skin, the shiny parts of the skin, the forehead, the tip of the nose. For women, the uh, shiny lipstick or the cheeks, you know, that's that's where you want to see. If you see just a little bit of zebra stripes, you know that the face is exposed properly. So it takes a little bit of finessing to get to learn how to use that. So you got to practice that. Uh, again, we've got it set for 90 IRE, and in, in your viewfinder, you won't really see this, okay? Uh, zebra stripes is, is on uh, the second button on the left side of your viewfinder, and it's a four, uh, uh, two, three push button uh, push. It's off, and then if you push it once, it says off, zebra off, and you push it again, it says zebra 70 plus or minus five. That's your, you know, your zebra one, 65 to 75, and then you press it again, it says 90 and above. Now, it only stays up on the screen for about five seconds, but you can look at the viewfinder and look at your waveform monitor and kind of tell whether or not they're on because if you're seeing zebra stripes on specular highlights and you look up here and you see this white above the top orange line here, you know you got zebra two stripes up. If you got, you know, seeing zebra stripes over all your mid-tone stuff down here and you look and you see that mid-tone is around 65 to 75, you know you got zebra one on. If you don't see any zebra stripes at all, and you, you know, that probably you don't have any zebra up on there. So you always have to have zebra two in weeks two, three. Uh, in week three, if you have a hand for the shutter speed shot in the shot, then you need to also use a zebra one. And then in week four, you're going to primarily be using zebra one because you're going to be shooting faces. Learn how to use the zebra stripes. And then those zebra stripes are tied to these two orange lines in the waveform monitor. This is at 70. This is at 90. So if you look at the waveform monitor, and I'm going to bring this down by just dialing in some ND filter here. Uh, and I have just dialed in six stops of ND, so it went completely black. So now if you look at the waveform monitor, right down here at the very bottom, there's a white line here that this, all the blacks are at right there. That's zero IRE. At 10 IRE, 10 to zero are your blacks. You start losing detail at 10 by 5, you've lost all detail in the blacks. A 10 to 30, those are your shadow areas. Those are the areas that are dark but still have a little bit of detail. 30 to about 70, where this orange line is. Those are your uh, mid-tones, your green grass, your blue sky, your beige wall, your brown couch, your you know, um, skin tones. Um, and then 70 to 90, uh, between these two lines, those are your highlights. Those are bright things in your shot that still have detail. And anything above this, 90 to 100, those are your whites. Those are blown out. So learn how to gauge that and look at what you're looking at. Now, the waveform monitor is top to bottom, 0 dB uh, pure black, 100 dB pure white. And then you have, this is called a graticule, by the way. You've got 0, 25, 50, 75, and then 100. And then you got the two orange zebra points. These are called zebra points at 70 and 90 that correspond with the zebra stripes. 90 being zebra 2, 70 being zebra 1. So that makes it really easy to learn this. And what you're looking at in the viewfinder, by the way, is you're looking at what's called a video signal. And these are pixels, okay? This is showing you pixels. And, and you can actually see what's in here. You can see the specular highlights right here, though the specular highlights. See that here, here, and here? There's this, the third specular highlight. You can see the black camera. You can see the lens. If you look really closely, you can see the lens. There's the specular highlight right in the middle of the lens right there. This is the lens going back, and you've got the highlights back here, the whites and stuff. Uh, on this and the blue, that's the blue back there. See how you kind of got an even blue across there. And then the really dark blacks and stuff back here, that's where this is at. Uh, and then, you know, so you can really begin to tell, you know, the left side over here is the left side of the frame, the right side is the right side of the frame. And if I move my hand in here, you can actually see my hand going in and out. You can see it moving in and out. Okay, see that? See how it's moving across there? You can see my hand and my wrist. On that um, so you just need to know how to learn this uh, read this learn how to read this and it takes about an hour of practice doing that so make sure you put in that hour of practice um, and and really get this down those are the, your three exposure aids your zebra stripes your peaking or zebra stripes your zebra point and the uh, waveform monitor here 
Uh, again, I just want to show you this real fast so you can get an idea of what this looks like. On the face for Zebra 1, this is where you want to see Zebra Stripes. You know, uh, that's kind of a hokey picture of that. And if you look really closely, you can see the Zebra Stripes on the specular highlight on the elephant's arm, and a little bit of Zebra Stripes here, and a little bit of Zebra Stripes here. And that's perfectly fine. That's what you want to see. It's okay to have a little bit of Zebra Stripes on your specular highlights. Here is uh, way overblown. This is really overexposed. This is telling you on Zebra 2 that all that entire image is overexposed. Uh, and so you just got to be aware of how to use that. Um, for your white balance, again, we did the white balance workflow uh, earlier in when we set up the shot. It's A, B, preset, bold. So just know that's the workflow. A, with your white card. B, with your white piece of printer paper. You take the white cards out of the shot. You dial in your preset number. With the shot set up and exposed and framed properly and then focus. Dial that preset number in between what you got for A and B. And then with the shot set up, you go up and down 500 degrees from that starting point and figure out which, where within that 1,000 degree range the, the, it looks the best to you. And you choose that. And then the last part is you take this white balance mode switch and you go up and down between A, B, and preset and figure out which one of those three uh, settings look the best to you. Now, when you're doing this, this is, again, retraining your eye to look at white balance a little bit differently, okay, a little bit more critically, because, again, since birth, your eye and your brain have been working in cahoots with each other to auto white balance everything for you. So every time you see something white, it goes, oh, that's white. We're going to make a little folder on our brain and a little database of that being white. Your eye can actually differentiate, they say, between about 50 different shades of white, um, you know, uh, and so, but when you first start looking at white balance and you're trying to figure out what white balance is, your eye can only see about 500 degrees Kelvin, which is problematic, you know. So what we're trying to do here is retrain your eye, and that happens very quickly if you do this, if you do the training on this, it happens very quickly. It happens with, in about, you know, 10 or 12 times of doing the white balance workflow here, you'll retrain your eye to be able to see 100 degrees Kelvin, which is what the human eye is capable of seeing. Important to understand that, okay? Well, so that's what we're doing. Um, when we talk about white balance, we're talking about color temperature. And color temperature is measured in something called Kelvin degrees. Um, basically, really simple. What you need to know is that the lower the number, it, it's a, it's, it starts at zero, goes all the way up to about 10,000. But for what we're seeing, it's somewhere around 23 to about 9,000. That's what you're going to see on this camera. And the lower the number, the warmer the light. The higher the number, the bluer the light. So it starts at about 23, which is, you know, a match is about 17. Sunset's about 23. Uh, the moon is about 41. Clear sky, blue sky, daylight, which is considered to be neutral light, white light, is 5,600 degrees Kelvin. And as you go up from that, it gets bluer. Um, very rare that you would see anything over 9,000 degrees, but occasionally you will. It's called northern skylight uh, on this. So you got to commit to memory these five Kelvin degree numbers. 3,200 degrees Kelvin, that's a primary color of, you know, orange that we see. Uh, this, the, it used to be the traditional indoor lighting for film and television. Now with LED lights and bicolor lights and all that stuff, plasma lights and hive lights and stuff like that, it's all gone by the wayside. I mean, you don't really see 32 used that much anymore. If you're inside and you've got a warm LED light bulb in your table lamp or desk lamp, that's probably more around 27 to 3,000. Most of them are right around 3,000. So just get to know that. That's the warmer light. And then 5,600 degrees Kelvin is your LED light. It's called a daylight bulb. That's why it's called a daylight, because it's 5,600 degrees Kelvin. And then outdoors, you have four Kelvin degree numbers. You need to get with them every 5,600 degrees Kelvin, blue sky day, sun directly overhead, not a cloud in the sky. 6,500 degrees Kelvin, partly cloudy sky day. A little bit of wispy clouds in front of the sun, but not a whole lot. And then an overcast day with shadows if the sun is being covered by clouds. But if you look on the ground and see shadows, that's about 7,500. And then socked in overcast day, no shadows, 8,500. Deep shade of a woods or canopy of a tree, 8,500. So if you know that, you can see that from outside, the light changes from about 5,000 to about 9,000, about 4,000 degrees. So you just, you know, uh, you know, Doug Jensen, who does the master class, and I have this little argument going that he says, anytime you're outside, just set your white balance for 5,600 and leave it. Uh, I have lots of friends that are DPs that do that. That's not correct. You know, the camera and your post-production software are really good about changing uh, and adjusting white balance within about a thousand degrees. If you get over a thousand degrees, yeah, good luck with that. You know, the the cameras or the 
um, the post-production color correction software is not really good at handling anything over a thousand degrees. So you always want to be as close as possible. So if you commit these numbers to memory, that symbol will take you 15 minutes to do it, you know, and it's things you're going to use for the rest of your career every day. So take the time right now to do that. So if you get good at this, and the whole point of this is by week four, we want you to be able to look at your light sources, tell what the color temperature is within 500 degrees, and just walk up there and dial in preset, go up and down 500 degrees looking at your shot, figure out which where it looks the best to you, and you're off to the races. But you can't do that right now. So that's why we're using the A and B white card to give us a ballpark of A and B that we can dial that preset number into instead of you just looking at the light and going, it's this color temperature. We're, we're letting the camera tell us what it thinks it is and give us the ballpark, and then we're dialing that number in, the ballpark, and then we're going up and down 500 degrees. Now, the reason we talk about 500 degrees all the time, first of all, um, when you first start out, that's all you can see. <clears throat> but, you know, white balance is a little subjective. What I think looks good may be two or 300 degrees different from what you think looks good. That's perfectly fine. But it's a little bit subjective. Anything over 500 degrees, that's not subjective anymore. That's just wrong. And you can easily see that once you get into using like Lightroom and stuff like that and you're using color correction. You can go up and down, see 500 degrees up, it goes warm, 500 degrees down, it goes blue. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to retrain your eye to see where that looks the best to you at. And so it's really important that you understand that. So, for example, here, you know, a 3200, that would be about 28 to 35, you know, is where that would be. 56, that would be 52 to 6,000. Uh, outdoors on a daylight, you know, 5,000 to 6,000, blue sky day, 6,000 to 7,000. Or partly cloudy sky day, 7,000, 8,000 overcast with shadows, 8,000 to 9,000 overcast, no shadows. There's a range there. Now, again, we want you to be as close as possible. Anything over 500 degrees, not subjective. It's wrong. Okay, so it needs to, all your numbers need to be within 500 degrees of each other and hopefully 100 to 200 degrees from each other. Read the manual. Uh, read the Zen of White Balance article in the vault. Watch the white balance video in the white balance assignment. Spend at least an hour practicing white balance A, B, custom, and preset white balance. Do it inside and out. Week three, you're going to be outside all the time shooting. So you need to really make sure that you, um, you know, know how to white balance inside and out. And know, uh, again, it's really important that you commit. The, by week four, we want you to have this down. We want you to have the three and D numbers committed to memory. And we want you to have the five um uh, f-stop numbers committed to memory you got to do that if this is not me saying to hey this would be really nice if you commit these to memory this is me saying to you if you don't commit these to memory you're going to be guessing at white balance you're not going to know how to do white balance and it's going to cost you a lot of points i guarantee you it's going to cost you a lot of points um <clears throat> let me go back in here for a second so again just get to know color temperature. The lower the number, the warmer the color temperature, the higher the number, the bluer the color temperature. Think about it in terms of a charcoal briquette, a good analogy here. You know, it, when you start out, it's black, okay? But when you heat that up, it turns orange and then, you know, red and then orange and then it goes a little yellow and then eventually it goes white. You see the little white. If you're able to heat it up enough, it would go blue. You can't do that on the grill, but if you were, it would go blue. Uh, but get to know these, you know, get to know these and get to know the two, you know, different types of white balance of the camera. There's A and B custom where you're letting the camera tell you what it thinks white balance should be. And you do that by using a white target, a white card or a white piece of printed paper, filling the frame all the way. Make sure you're lighting under the main light source inside your key light, which is the main light source outside is your sun. Uh, and that you're exposing it properly. And again, think about what you're doing. These look exactly the same to your eye, and you're white balancing them under the same light, and you're exposing them the same way and filling the frame. So logically, uh, you know, those two numbers should be really close to each other or exactly the same. Now, the reason we use white printer paper, a lot of people don't realize this, printers put blue ink in printer paper to make it look brighter to consumers. So depending on the printer paper you're using, if you're using super bright white printer paper, it's probably going to be two or 300 degrees different from your white card. If you're using just standard printer paper, it's going to probably be pretty close to your, your white card. Just know that. That's why we use white printer paper for this, so that it would give you a little bit of a ballpark. And again, make sure you do the white balance workflow. Really simple. We go through it here. A with your white card, B with a white piece of printer paper. Make sure that you're filling the frame and exposing it properly using the key light. And then 
Um, you take those out, you dial your preset number in between those two numbers with the shot set up, you go up and down 500 degrees, select the spot that looks the best to you there. Now you got three numbers all within 500 degrees of each other. The final step is you go back and forth between A, B, and preset with the shot set up, figure out which one of those three settings look the best to you, and you bold that in the camera report to let me know that's the one you chose. A, B, preset. Really simple. So you got to learn how to do this. You got to know how to do this by week two. If you don't, your grade's going to suffer dramatically. Let's talk about shutter speed. So we set our shutter based on John Cena. If you haven't seen this already, John Cena is a wrestler and the actor and his gimmick is you can't see me now. Puts his hand in front of his face and goes, you can't see me now. What I want you to do is do that. So if you put your hand in front of your face and you move your fingers back and forth really fast like this, you can see it on, on, on the video here. Your, your fingers blur and you see that with your eye. That's the natural motion blur you see with your eye. Most people don't even know they see a natural motion blur, but that's what you see. So in still photography, when you're shooting one single image at a time, it doesn't matter what your shutter speed is because you've got a frozen image, okay, you, one shot. In video, it does because you've got moving video. So what we're trying to do with our shutter speed in video is we're trying to mimic 99% of the time that natural motion blur that we see with our eye. Now, in the last 120 years, that we've about 102 years, we've been shooting 24 frames a second. Uh, in cinema, uh, they've come up with a, a rule called the 180 degree shutter speed rule. And that rule basically states that if you want to emulate the natural motion blur you see with your eye, with your shutter speed, you simply set your shutter speed at twice your frame rate. So what's the frame rate we're shooting in this class? 23.97, or for most people that would be called 24 frames a second. You double 24, and what's that? 48th. So that's why we shoot at 148th. Now in North America, there are three frame rates that you shoot that have audio embedded on them. 24 frames a second. 30 frames a second and 60 frames a second. 24 is a film frame rate. Almost all motion pictures were shot at 24 frames a second even today. 30 and 60 are television frame rates. Those are based on the 60 cycle electrical system. On your camera, your camera will also do three other frame rates. 50 and 25, those are European frame rates based on the 50 cycle electrical system they have over there. And then there's actually a 24 frame per second in your frame rates and that's for transferring directly from video to film which you're never going to do now the reason it says 23.97 and 29.97 23.98 29.97 and 59.94 is because of something called drop frame time code it's not exactly 30 frames a second and so they have to compensate for that so that's where those numbers come in but generically speaking, we talk about that in terms of 24, 30, and 60 for any audio in North America that have, you know, have video, video with audio on it. So, again, if you're shooting at uh, 24 frames a second, your shutter speed would be right around 148th. Now, it could be 140th, it could be 150th. That's perfectly fine. But in this class, we're doing 148th. For uh, 30 frames a second, it's uh, double that, 160th of a second. For 60 frames a second, it's 1 120th. Again, it's called the 180 degree shutter speed rule. We use that often. Um, so in week three, you're going to be shooting a fast and slow shutter speed shot. You're going to, and fast, medium, and slow. You're going to shoot at 1 1,000th, 1 148th, and two frames. That's six and two thirds stops difference. Now, the thing you have to realize is that um, every time you double your shutter speed, you need to stop more light. So if you go from 1 148th to 1 96, one stop, 1 96 to 200, two stops, 1 200 to 1 400, three stops, 1 400 to 1 800, four stops, 1 800 to 1000, that's four and a third stops. And then again, if you go 24, uh, 48 to 24, that's one stop. Uh, 12, that's two stops. Six, that's three stops. We go to a super slow mo, a super shutter speed mode uh, at uh, beyond 24. It goes to two frames a second, which is equivalent to about two and a third stops. Of, and it goes two, th two frames, three frames, four frames, five frames, six frames, seven frames, eight frames, 16 frames, 32 frames, and 64 frames. 64 frames is like, you know, seven and a half stops of light. So, uh, again, the lower the shutter speed, the less light you need, but the more it blurs, this is a little blurry, the higher the shutter speed, the more light you need, and um, the uh, more frozen the motion is in the shot. Again, every time you double your shutter speed, you need to stop more light. Um, every time you have it, you need to stop less light. Shutter thing, shutter speed affects two things, motion blur and aperture. Again, we talked about aperture and we talked about motion blur. Uh, that's it. Um, uh, you'll learn more about that in week three, by the way. There's a whole assignment in there on how to do that. Um, you can get out of auto shutter speed. And let me just show you this. So 
Shutter speed is a little different. You know, on most of these menus, if you press the button, like if I press the button for f-stop once, it puts a white box around it. If I press it and hold it in, it gives me a sub-menu, the auto and manual. You don't want to be in manual, so you always want to be there, and then you hit it again, it goes away. Uh, or it's like it. With shutter speed, it's a little different. If you hit it once, it puts a white box around it. If you hit it and hold it in, it gives you a sub-menu. Auto, which you don't want to be in, off. You can't really turn it off. It's basically doing double your frame rate. And then sp speed, this is what you want it on. You want to set the speed for whatever you want. 148th for 24 frames a second, um, 23.98. Or a 160th for uh, 29.97. Or 1 one twentieth for 59.94 up here. Uh, this is ECS, Electronic Clear Scan. If you go back to the old days of analog monitors and you saw television shows, you would sometimes see them shooting monitors and the monitors would be rolling. You'd have a roll bar in it. You could actually dial that roll bar out by going in here and going into Electronic Clear Scan and dialing this in. You're not going to use that at all. It needs to be 148. We don't need to see ECS. We don't need to see A in front of it. We don't need to see it off. Okay, that's what we need to see. So uh, just make sure that that's what you're seeing in there. And I'm going to hit it again and get out of that. Um, out of that one more time. There we go. Okay. Uh, if you can't change your shutter speed from 148th, chances are that you're not at 23.97, or you're not at um, uh, you don't you're at not at 1080, 1920 by 1080. So make sure you check that first. And then, of course, um, you know you need to learn. Uh, shutter speed is all about how fast the object is moving. So there are different things that you shoot at different shutter speeds. And this is a really basic infographic, but I think I have a better infographic in here. Uh, there's in the, in the assignment itself that walks you through different shutter speeds you would shoot things at for human motion, for fast birds flying, for cars, for bullets, you know, going through a balloon or a watermelon arrow going through a watermelon, different shutter speeds that you need. So just get to know that. Again, most of the time you're going to be shooting at double your frame rate to emulate the natural motion blur, but there will be occasions where you want to change your shutter speed to freeze motion or blur motion, specifically when you're doing like time lapse and things like that. ISO, like I said, ISO is the sensor sensitivity to light. Every sensor is set up to be at a base or native ISO. Again, this should be ISO gain because we talk about those interchangeably. Uh, and a gain is at zero dB. Um, every time you double your ISO, you need to stop, you add a stop more sensitivity to your sensor. Every time you half your ISO, uh, you take away a stop of sensitivity. For gain, it's every 6 dB. So you start at zero, which is your base or native ISO. 6 dB is one stop, 12 dB is another stop. And that's why we have that set up for your gain selection on the left side of your camera. So right below the ISO gain button, there is a, um, switch that says low medium and high and low is at zero db which it needs to be all the time uh medium is at 6 db and 12 high is at 12 db and you can see it increased by one stop and if you look at this those are right at 90 that goes up to about you know one stop that goes up to 100 and then that goes up even more so in essence uh, every stop you add is about 20 IRE in the viewfinder. Just know that. Easy, easy way to learn that. Okay, that's, that's basically it. So, um, again, you want to keep it at the base gain at zero dB all the time. And, and so there's also this new thing called a dual base ISO. Uh, you won't see Sony calling this a dual base ISO, however. Um, that's shutter speed. We've gone through that. Um, let me go back. Um, there's the exposure triangle. Um, um, let's see here. ISO gain. Um, this is how you set your ISO. Right here, there's ISO gain button, and there's low, medium, and high. Uh, ISO low is set for 800. These, these are all long, so I'm not sure why these are in there. That's not true anymore. Um, in this class, you can dial ISO up from 640 to 1000. Again, you, you can change all this. Um, so uh, this is your ISO gain switch. This is your ISO uh, uh, low, medium, and high switch. ISO gain button, uh, low, medium, and high switch on this. Um, if you go back in here, go down one more. Um, so again, you shouldn't have to change this. It should stay on zero all the time in this class. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, again, the exposure triangle or those three things that we talked about before, ISO, uh, shutter speed, and aperture. 
And so you can adjust all three of those in still photography, but in video, we added the fourth thing, which is neutral density filters. Neutral density filters are like sunglasses for your camera. Um, you know, we call that the exposure rectangle, aperture, shutter speed, ISO, and, and neutral density filter. But in video, because we're trying to emulate the natural motion blur, shutter speed comes out. It's usually twice our frame rate. For ISO, we're always wanting to shoot at the base ISO that comes out. And for neutral density filters, you only really use neutral density filters a couple times. Once, like your sunglasses, if it's super bright outside and you're at an F22, your iris all the way down to the smallest aperture you can get on the camera, and it's still too bright, you would have to dial in an ND filters. Now, the key is you got to know the math. you got to know how many stops you're taking out and how many stops of F-stop you have so that you can balance that out. Remember, your lens only does five stops. Your ND filter will take away six stops. So you have a lot of power there. In week three, you're going to have to adjust both of those, so you have to do the math. And so you have to commit these to memory. I just can't, I can't say that enough to you. You have to know the math. In the exposure assignment in week two, there's a whole infographic that walks you through there. So just know ND1 is two stops. ND2 is four stops. ND3 is six stops. The mnemonic is, you know, you double the number. ND1, double one, two. ND2, double two, uh, four. ND3, double uh, three, uh, six. Uh, so you also know, have to know the fractions. You know, ND1 is a quarter ND. ND2 is the 16th ND, and ND3 is the 64th ND, and um, that's it. Um, this is the FX6, uh, not the FX5. Um, so uh, it's got a built-in electronic neutral density filter. And if you look on the left side of the camera, um, there is uh, right above the multifunction dial, there's a little white, uh, the little button that's lit up orange. That's telling you that you have no ND filter in. If you push the button right above that as a plus sign, you dial in ND filter. So that ND filter dial in. You can see it down here, it says a quarter ND. And then if you dial in it again, you don't see a filter dial in. It just gets darker by two stops. And it says a 16th ND. <clears throat> you dial it in again, and it goes to 64th ND. So again, if this is accurate, every time we go up, you know, two stops, that's 40 IRE. So if I go here and hit that to... Uh, 116 that didn't go up 40 and if I hit that that didn't go up you know another 40 so that's that's a little off on that so we're talking about maybe a stop of uh, of exposure but it is you know for math wise it's two stops so just know that and you can get out of that now you also have electronic variable ND on this camera where if you have this on variable and you have this set to ND2 then you can dial this in a third of a stop at a time all the way up to 1 to 128th, which is seven stops. We're not using this in this class because you don't, you have to know how many stops exactly you're taking out to use it, and you don't know that. So keep that on preset. If I see any ND filter that you have dialed in that is anything other than clear, ND1, a quarter ND, ND2, a 16th ND, or ND3, a 64th ND, you lose points. Down the road, you need to commit those to memory, all 21 of those ND filters, and it does it in, um, quarter stops instead of third stops so just know that very cool and uh, i use nd variable nd filter as exposure so if i'm outside setting and i want to keep the same depth of field between shots i set my aperture for that depth of field then i use my variable nd filter outside inside it's a little harder because you don't have the amount of light that you need uh, to do that with so that's your neutral density filters so so um and then here's where all the information is on your density. This is, you know, off and on. You turn your ND filters off and on. When this button is lit up red, it's off. And then you just keep hitting the plus button to dial those in two stops at a time. Hit the minus button to dial it out. This is your preset and variable. You want it on preset. This is If you have it on variable and you have a quarter ND dialed in, then you can adjust this dial and go up a quarter stop at a time. And then this camera also has a auto electronic variable ND filter. And you would use that, for example, if you were outside and you were shooting an interview and you had a big key light set up on the person so they were lit properly so the light stayed the same on them. But in the background, the sun was partly cloudy and the sun was going in and out. Okay, in the background, your background was getting brighter and darker. You put this on auto electronic variable ND and that automatically compensates for that sun going in and out. It keeps your background relatively the same exposure. So it's a pretty cool little feature to learn how to use. Only a few cameras have this, so make sure that you understand how to do it. So that's it. That's focus exposure, white balance, uh, shutter speed, ISO, and ND filter. Everything that you need to know how to use. If you have any questions or need any help, don't hesitate to reach out to me.